Hi, and welcome to Staying Connected. This is Katie, your host, and today I have Annie with me. Hi. Hey, Annie. So the fun thing about this episode is that I actually have Annie here in person. Yeah, yeah. And she is the first person that I have met with beds, and it has been amazing to get to know her. So thank you for joining me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, for, I'm. Thank you for letting me be here next to you and <laughs> answer all these questions. So many questions. So... We've already talked a lot, so we're going to go through what we've talked about. Um, but for the listeners who haven't met you, like, how old are you? Uh, I'm 34. And how long have you known that you have VEDS? I was told I had VEDS probably when I was about nine, and I was officially diagnosed with a blood test when I was about 14. So this is something you've known most of your life? My whole life, yeah. Yep. I can't imagine what that would be like. Um... I would like to say it's gotten easier, but that's definitely not the case. Every time something happens to somebody or new information comes out, it's it's just more things that you have to understand and deal with. Yeah. So what kind of things have you dealt with? Uh, well, I've had migraines my whole life. Um, and with uh, vascular Ehlers-Danlos, I was um, diagnosed with uh, in in two internal carotid artery aneurysms in 2007, and um, then everything was pretty much fine until 2016, and that's kind of when things, when shit hit the fan, I guess. So what shit hit the fan? Um, so I thought I had a kidney infection. I was driving home from a road trip from Montana with my mom, and we were in Spokane, And my right side started hurting. It was like the worst pain imaginable. And I told my mom, we're not stopping in Spokane because (laughs) I I can't be in the hospital in Spokane. Um, We also thought, I thought it was just like an ovarian cyst that was rupturing because I've had, well, we think we've, I've had a history of that, but it turns out those could probably be other aneurysms that were dissecting at the time. But so came home after that pain, drove home from Spokane, hung out in my hometown, Centralia. And um, the next morning, it was a Sunday morning, I still had some right side pain. Mm -hmm. And my boyfriend, Jason, and I at the time, we were heading back up north towards Seattle to go home. And... um, Pain just started getting really bad, and I we got home. I decided to take a nap, thinking that would help my pain, and it didn't. I woke up, and we decided to go to ER, and it turned out it was not a kidney infection. It was my renal artery had dissected. Oh, my gosh. So what did they do? Well, at first, they thought it was a kidney infection also before they gave me a scan, so they weren't really believing. I don't want to say they weren't believing me, but I don't think they were taking my pain as seriously as it was, but I also think... A lot of people with vascular Ehlers-Danlos have a high pain tolerance. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, they uh, gave me a scan. They admitted me to a bigger hospital, a nearby hospital, and I was just kind of hanging out for the time being, trying to figure out what was going to happen or if anything else was going to happen and trying to get a hold of doctors and just kind of seeing what the next step was. So uh, that was August 20th, 2016, uh, I was admitted at like 2 a.m. or something like that. Mm-hmm. The next day, first I want to say that my memory about all this is not the best. Um, so if I am wrong on my timeline or something, please forgive me. <laughs> but I, I here I go know. back check by calling my mom. <laughs> uh, so uh, the next day I was fine and I was in a, on a regular floor at Tacoma General. And then slowly more things just started rupturing to the point where um, I had brought four other aneurysms rupture and or dissect. I'm not quite sure what happened there, but probably rupture because there was a whole lot of blood in my abdomen yeah. that was just floating around. Um, but they told my mom, you know, to prepare for the worst that I most likely wasn't going to be leaving the hospital. And then on August 29th, after about four other aneurysms had ruptured that week, um, I had gone to the bathroom, and I was going climbing back up into my bed, and my mom was with me. Thank goodness if she wasn't there, who knows what would have happened. Mm -hmm. But I said, I think I'm going to pass out, 
And my mom literally just watched my heart rate and my blood pressure plummet. She had been a nurse for 35 years or so and yelled code blue. And all the nurses came and they yelled code blue and they started CPR and I was intubated. I was intubated, I think, for around 36 hours. They tried pulling the tube out a couple of times, but I wasn't breathing on my own, so they kept it in. I woke up, and I don't... I like to think that I knew that I had, like, been somewhere else because when I woke up, I was so mad that I was where I was and not where I had previously been, if that makes (laughs) sense. Like, when I was out, when I was intubated, it could have been the drugs too, I guess. (laughs) But I was in the best place possible. Like, it was peaceful and warm. And I think about it sometimes still, and it's like, it just sounds... It just was a beautiful place to be in, feeling-wise, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, But, yeah, I was really mad, confused, didn't know where I was. Finally, they started um, answering my questions the best they could because they didn't know what I was asking because I still had the tube. I was still intubated. And from then, I was in the ICU for five weeks with no other complications besides I, um, my internal carotid arteries. One of them turned into a carotid cavernous sinus fistula, I think is the actual full name mm-hmm. for it. I like to just call it fistula. It's better. Yeah, it's easier. easier to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some people call it like a CCF or something. I'm like, yeah. no, I'm fistula. That's good for me. Um. But we didn't know it was a fistula actually until I was di- or until I was released from the hospital five weeks and then a few days later. So um, when was this now? So like August 29th in 2016. So um, I didn't get out of the hospital until September 27th, maybe 2016. And then a couple days after that, my mom realized that my fistula, something was actually going on because I had double vision. Um, my eyelid was super droopy. In fact, I compared myself to Quasimodo. Mm-hmm. After not seeing yourself for five weeks and you look in the mirror yeah. and you see that, like it was horrifying. I had the worst headache over that eye. And I had what I compared to a wash machine in my head. Mm-hmm. I felt like I was yelling. I couldn't hear other people just... And what what the wash machine sound was is just the pressure of your heartbeat against the um, nerve and the other vessels up in your head from the fistula. Mm-hmm. Uh, so about September 28th, 29th, 2016, we finally figured out what was going on. Dr. Byers met us in the Harborview Hospital to, you know, kind of be there in case the doctors had any questions on what they should do next. And uh, because of Dr. Byers being there, he put us in contact with Dr. Daniel Hollum, which I call him Dr. Dan. (laughs) And a month later, after a lot of discussion and a lot of appointments on deciding what we should do, we decided to put two coils in my vein next to my carotid artery aneurysm because... Putting coils in the artery with the weak arteries could put more pressure on things and um, even just, excuse me, getting the coils up there from the groin because they have to start in the groin could cause some uh, major problems because Mm -hmm. of all the aneurysms and trauma that I had uh, in my abdomen previously. So Dr. Dan decided to do it the venous route, which has hardly been done. And I was told that nobody with vascular ehlers stainless has done the venous route and it was kind of like a first-time thing sort of yeah. thing. So that's kind of exciting. There's a medical paper out there somewhere <laughs> about me. Well, not about me, but... Well, it is about me, but who knows <laughs> what the name is that they use. You know, it's probably like Girl 34 or whatever. <laughs> Girl 34. <laughs> right? Um, uh, so, yeah, he fixed the, the, the fistula. And that was one of the happiest days of my life, waking up from that surgery and not hearing the wishing anymore because I was going downright crazy with a wash machine inside my head. Yeah, I can't imagine what that would be. Like, sometimes I get a whoosh from my pseudoaneurysm and yeah. my carotid, but it doesn't last a really long time. It doesn't prevent me from hearing anybody. It's just kind of annoying. It's and But think of that 24-7, yeah. like, constantly going to sleep was a battle. 
I'd wake up and just scream almost. Like I, what, one reason why we went um, for further options to, to try and fix the fish look because I, I told my neurologist at the time, like, we need to figure this out or I will fix it somehow. Like, one way or the other, I will figure <laughs> out a way to stop the whooshing <laughs> in my ears. Um, but they fix it, and it was great. And I don't have eyesight really in my left eye. It's like a um, dilated pupil all the time. It's blurry. And um, just about maybe two or three weeks ago, a month ago, I stopped actually getting headaches. That's um, great. I had had a headache every single day since August 29th, 2016. That's miserable. And, I mean, from somebody who's suffered from migraines since I was six, seven, these headaches don't even compare, which is like I could do more things with them, like do more daily activities than with a migraine because these headaches don't make me nauseous, Mm -hmm. but they're, it's like somebody has literally just punched me in the eye. That's what it feels like. And And you don't have that anymore. I, yeah, yeah. So there are days where I do have that, but it's not every day and it's not like, I'm terrified to wake up sort of thing yeah. or um, just I'm waiting to go to bed with an ice pack sort of thing. But yeah. yeah, it's I'm very happy that they're gone. That's crazy. So what were you doing before then? And like how have things changed since then? Before I got sick, I was doing okay. Um, my, the way I grew up was we were kind of, I don't want to say raised to be tough, but like, aches and pains and stuff were kind of just I don't want to say dismissed but not looked at like they were um necessarily important I guess and so since being sick I've realized that all of these little aches and pains and things that I grew up with weren't normal like these are things that people with Ehlers-Danlos have because they don't have the strong joints and just how our body works and things like that we just um, are different. And so that, that's one thing that I learned. Things, other things before I got sick was I kind of just led a normal life. I did what I want. <laughs> I did some pretty stupid things. But um, I, living with Ehlers Dean Los, my literally my whole life, not just knowing that I had it, but seeing my dad had it, have it, and live with it, and see how he lived his life made me kind of say I'm gonna live my life the best I can because I know I only have one of them but actually I have two because I coded already and <laughs> that's yeah, a fa- second yeah that's a family <laughs> joke no YOLO here um, <laughs> what that mean like no I only like YOTO YOTO or something <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but so because of that, I didn't want to put any limitations on myself. Yeah. And, you know, I've done things that I probably shouldn't have done, but I'm here now. And But definitely after being sick, there's more, more of my common sense shining through, I feel like. Like I'm questioning things that I do now, but then at the same time, I'm like, screw it. I want to do this and I'm going to do it. Yeah. And I only have so long, so let's check it off. <laughs> um, health wise things have been good since everything um, all of my aneurysms I have 10 in total from my like uh, carotid arteries to my iliacs and uh, they're all growing still uh, the carotid artery aneurysm I found out in November got bigger and uh, because the coils are in my veins up there there's nothing really we can't really do anything else it's kind of just like okay we've done everything we can do now it's kind of a waiting game sort Mm -hmm. of thing um they gave me a couple options in november with what i could do one was obviously do nothing one was block off the um the the arteries or excuse me the aneurysms or the arteries with the aneurysms Mm -hmm. and put a bovine bridge in which is they take a artery from a cow okay. and they connect the two arteries together huh. by bridging this bridging it with the cow artery so like my blood would be passed through the cow artery to the other side of the good leg 
Oh, like kind of like a bypass? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It just kind of goes around the aneurysm instead of... Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And I have lots of fun jokes about how I couldn't be a vegan and stuff like that. (laughs) (laughs) Or maybe I'd be part cow. I don't know. I couldn't decide. Um, But all of these options that they gave me were pretty much, we don't even know if you'll survive the surgery. Yeah. Like it was 50-50 chance chance of just surviving the surgery. And then they also told me, we don't know what your life will be like if you decide to do one of these surgeries. So like you're you're in somewhat good health now. You're not in too much pain, but you might come out of the surgery and be bedridden for the rest of your days. Yeah. And how I looked at it was I was bedridden long enough. It drove me crazy. I would much rather have quality of life over quantity of life. Mm-hmm. And it 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 Definitely put me back a couple spots, steps hearing all of this news. I had one vascular surgeon tell me, you know, uh, six to 18 months sort of thing is what I have left. I don't, nobody knows when your expiration date is. It is terrifying because all of these aneurysms are growing. But you can't put a time limit limit on it. Like for me at least. Yeah. It's I'm living every day to the fullest and doing as much as I can to make sure that I don't regret anything. So since then, um, things have obviously been different. You're taking other things into consideration that before you maybe weren't. Um, so what kind of things do you like to do or participate in now? So I've taken up Nia, which is like a... a a dancing sort of fitness class Mm -hmm. and I'm I have no rhythm I have no beat I am definitely (laughs) um uh in not I I I can't dance let's just say it like that (laughs) so I'm the person in the class that's literally off beat by like two counts and (laughs) But it's helped because it put me back out there. I was I like I like to think of my myself as a fairly active person. Person before I got sick, I ran, um, I went on walks. I have a wonderful Boston Terrier Lula May who accompanies me with everything. And um, I just the year after I was sick, I was told pretty much I couldn't run. I couldn't, and I've been running since I was like twelve or thirteen. Mm-hmm. And so I mean I kind of went into a depression but then I kind of got this feeling like well I can't live like this the rest of my life I gained weight which has not happened to me in like ever pretty much so um I started picking up all my old activities again I started running again a little bit that's kind of a secret to some people but that's okay (laughs) um just being a little bit more active and I've also started painting so yeah um I was always too scared to paint before why? I, that's what everybody asks. I was like, it was just, it, it's always intimidated me. Mm-hmm. I always um, I always felt like I kind of had a good eye, like, with taking pictures and stuff. And then finally I just was like, I saw a YouTube video. I'm like, I'm going to do it. <laughs> so then I started doing it, and it's really helped. Um, but I feel like the, the main thing that I've realized or changed in my life after being sick is the compassion and the love that I have for everybody. Like, I may say something really, really mean, but I still love everybody. And, like, if I say something mean to you, I'm going to hug you the next second, apologize, and kiss (laughs) you all over the face. Like, I, I don't like seeing people hurting. I don't like people in pain. And that's the one thing that I've like want to keep spreading after I've been sick just because all the compassion and love that people gave me when I was sick was kind of overwhelming sometimes Mm -hmm. and most of the time like the posts on Facebook my mom kept people up to date when I was in the hospital and stuff and I couldn't read those for a long time because I would just be overwhelmed with all of this emotion because so many people I never even met yeah were sending me, praying for me, sending me cards and wishing me well. And it's just, I want to keep, I want to pay it forward, I guess. Yeah. So I just try and make sure that I show everybody as much love and compassion as I can. That's sweet. (laughs) Thanks. I know I've experienced a little bit of that just with what 
what seems to me like minor stuff that I've been through compared to what you've been through no. already. It's just like I have some of that. Just I just want to hug everybody. Yeah. I'm just like, I just love you. <laughs> well, we don't know. We really don't know. don't know what the person next to us is going through. No. I mean, when I was healing, yeah, I was kind of up and about. I was going grocery shopping and stuff. But there were days where, like, I couldn't walk. I, like, after getting out of the hospital, I had to relearn to walk pretty much. I had to relearn to get myself dressed, like, brushing my teeth, brushing my hair, taking a shower. Yeah. Was everything, like, I needed help with. And it was insane that I was as young as I was and had, like, an 80-year-old body. And then I would heal, you know, a couple weeks later, I'd, I'd be feeling better. I'd go out and, like, I had a handicapped parking permit and I got dirty looks one day and it's just like you don't that's definitely one thing I learned you can't judge a book by its cover you Mm -hmm. don't know what somebody is dealing with even if they look happy you don't know you have no idea what's going on yeah I can totally totally relate to that um so you said that your dad had this and I think your brother has it too Mm -hmm, my older brother so tell me about them and your experience growing up Uh, so, dad was my best friend, and he, um, on a Saturday morning, I think, it was this weekday morning, or weekend morning, I'll say, he passed out, and my mom was screaming his name, and next thing I know, ambulances are showing up at my house, and he is in the hospital, and what had happened is one of his arteries had ruptured, and they were trying to figure out what was going on. And how old were you? I was eight okay. at the time. So um, they didn't like what they found at our local hospital. Uh, they were kind of not, I don't want all medical staff are amazing, but there are sometimes medical staff that aren't as bright as they should be, I feel like. And uh, so dad ended up being airlifted to Harborview, or yeah, no, excuse me, U- UW Medical Center, mm-hmm. where... Uh, he had surgery and was put in touch with um, a wonderful surgeon, Dr. Dellinger, who then put us in touch with Dr. Byers, mm-hmm. who diagnosed my father after listening to all of the um, the things that he had gone through his whole life and whatnot, and was diagnosed. And I was brought into a room with my brother where our arms were looked at and examined. Your arms. Our arms are like. Um, our forearms and I don't think our chest was but definitely our arms they were looking for you know the thin skin and the veins and Mm -hmm. how soft and stretchy it was and I don't know what doctor it was I'm assuming it was Dr. Byers but he looked at my arm and he kind of ran his finger up and down my arm and he's like yeah you have it and I remember just being okay Okay. Like, eight. I'm what eight. does that mean to you? Yeah, eight. nobody really explained anything to me. Because yeah. I, was, I was so young. What were they to going to explain to me? Right. Um, he, I mean, he obviously was right because I was diagnosed, officially diagnosed when I was 14 um, by Dr. Byers. And uh, both my brother and I. My brother was diagnosed um, when he was probably 12 or 13. He okay. got diagnosed before me. Um, but dad was in and out of the hospital and then they finally was, were able to diagnose him and figure out what was going on. And, uh, we spent, after he was out of the hospital, we kind of lived life normally. We went camping, yeah. had just normal life. I don't think mom and dad really explained to Spencer and I, my, my brother, the severity of the situation. Um, because after dad was diagnosed, it was probably about a year or so later, it's December 12th, 1994, that, uh, dad was working. He went back to work as normal. He was a parks maintenance man mm-hmm. for our local parks in, um, Lewis County. And he got out of the vehicle to go chain up a garbage can for the night and he just collapsed. His aorta ruptured and... Uh, it's kind of amazing the timing of it all because if he forgot he had forgotten to go back to this park to do something and if he never would have remembered to go back to the park he would have been home or driving 
when his aorta ruptured. Mm -hmm. So he would have either been home with me and my brother alone, or who knows what would have happened if he was driving. Like, that could have hurt somebody else. Or So it's kind of like a, a blessing that he did it there. That park is now very special to all of us, obviously. Um, but, yeah. So you don't think it was anything that he did? It was just gonna happen when no matter what he did yep yep he was he, i mean we don't know if he was getting out of the car or getting back into the car because mm -hmm. the car door was open and he was laying on the pavement oh, yeah. so and i think the car was still on because i mean he literally had one one or two tasks to do so he was getting out really quick doing yeah. it knowing my father he was probably i don't want to say anxious but he was probably excited he's like i gotta get home because yeah um, my dad was always the first one to arrive home and I remember that night I was decorating the Christmas tree and I remember thinking it's getting dark out and dad's not home like something's up mm -hmm. but you don't ever think that the worst case scenario yeah. until the worst case scenario has happened to you I feel like then that's your first <laughs> At yeah. least for me, at least. Because <laughs> now every time somebody's like five minutes late, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> oh man. That so, makes sense. <clears throat> yeah. Sorry, what were That's you That's so say? sad. I'm sorry. Oh, I just no, admit. It's, <laughs> like, I tend to talk about it really fast sometimes because I don't want to feel it. It is yeah. really, really sad for me still. It's very, very hard for me still. Um, that was actually one of the first things I wrote on a piece of paper when I was intubated was what would dad think? Like, what does that mean for you? Uh, well, like I said, he was my best friend, and it. I'm kind, sometimes I'm pissed at him that he's not here helping my brother and I through this. Uh, sometimes I'm like, thank God you're not here because I don't want you to witness this, and then that makes me instantly go to my mom. Like she has nursed her husband yeah. back from health and watched him die. She's nursed my brother back from health. My brother hasn't died yet. She's nursed me back to health. Like, it's how much pain can this woman go through? But, um, I mean, both my parents are very special people. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so what is your... It's really hard for me to talk about my dad. I'm it's sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's totally fine. It would be weird of us not to have emotions about any of this. So, um, what has your brother been through? What has my brother been through? Mm -hmm. um, he He's mainly had a lot of joint problems, which I feel like is kind of funny. Like, his, um, he's broken his ankle before. Um, uh, he's ruptured his Achilles tendon. Mm -hmm. But, like, he, he his bowel ruptured in Christmas 2011. And um, that was pretty serious. That was scary. Uh, he had a colostomy for about six months. Um, Is that like the bag? Yeah, it's the bag. And he had it reversed, and he was fine. Everything's good with him. Um, about last month or so, he was diagnosed with an iliac aneurysm and I think a renal artery aneurysm. Um, he's always been the type of person to where he's going to ignore uh, the severity of this. Like, mm he... -hmm. He... He doesn't talk to me much about it because I think he'd much rather not deal with it, which I don't blame him. Yeah. I mean, there are times where I feel I don't want to deal with it either. So, but that's just how he does it. And he's he's getting by. Yeah. He's doing his thing. He's happy. He's living his life. So. Wow. Is there anything else that you want to mention? Is there anything else that you've been through that's been... Something you want the listeners to know, or? Um, gosh, I'm sure there is, but I can't think of anything. <laughs> I was talking to somebody about this, about being, I was nervous about coming on here, I told you earlier. <laughs> and he said, this is, you know, your story to, like, get it out there. And now I'm curious if I got it all out there. <laughs> I'm, I, I have a feeling I'm going to listen to this and be like, no, I have so much more to say. <laughs> well, but I've really enjoyed talking to you. I've really enjoyed talking to you. I really so enjoyed <laughs> finding you, and now you're leaving me. <laughs> 
Golly, but there's internet and stuff. There's internet, yeah. and I'll be back. Yeah, yeah. And I'll I mean, back. I can come see you in Florida, too. Florida's, Hell yeah, you should. <laughs> Florida's really nice. <laughs> so <laughs> Florida's hot as hell. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's true. I, I'll probably wait until, like, December or something. To yeah, that's see. the best time. Like, Jan- wait till January. January? Either. Okay. Yeah, good then you know, know you're going to get some nice cold snaps. <laughs> yeah, so you're going to come visit me in Florida, and I'm going to come visit you here. Yeah. <laughs> And it's been an amazing experience getting to know you, and I, I look forward to getting to know you more. Well, I like to say you're stuck with me. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy about that. <laughs> All right. So thank you, and thank you, everybody, for listening. This was Staying Connected, and this was Annie. I'm going to be doing podcast episodes, releasing on the last Sunday of every month. I know it hasn't been quite clear that that's what's happening, but the last Sunday of every month, hopefully we will have an episode out. So thank you for listening, and I'll see you soon.